Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming to this talk. I'd first like to thank my co-authors. Uh, Charlie and I are at Rocky Mountain Research Station in Boise, have since moved to the Northwest Watershed Research Center, also in Boise. Uh, Seth is at University of Georgia, and Walter is at University of Bristol. And the reason that we did this study is because it's attractive to try to predict future hydrologic droughts using uh, available climate projections. Uh, before we do that, we, it's important to have a good grasp of uh, what causes low flows. And um, oh, that's fine. Thanks. so uh, the, we, our goal was to um, basically just contribute to the mechanistic understanding of hydrologic droughts. Our specific objectives were to quantify low flow metric trends in the Pacific Northwest, quantify the sensitivities of those low flow metrics to precipitation and temperature, and with those results, kind of discuss the uncertainty of future hydrologic droughts. Uh, we've seen a lot of important slides uh, over the session, and I'd like to point out that for hydrologic droughts and in-stream flow droughts, uh, it's important to get a handle on the magnitude and trends of these low flows. Uh, so that we can protect ecosystem habitat and water quality through waste load allocation. So the Pacific Northwest is also a very important place to do these kinds of studies because historic data has shown that uh, discharge timing is happening earlier, discharge amount is going down, we're getting low snow accumulations, and large fires are having a higher occurrence. So in this study, we're going to use uh, low flow metrics as indicators of hydrologic droughts at 42 stream gauges that you can see there on our map for 65 years, and that's from 1948 to 2013. And what we found were that um, trends are largely negative in low flow metrics, which means low flow metrics are getting lower and that these low flow metrics are at least, if not more, sensitive to precipitation amount effects than they are to air temperature effects. And the reason that we could do this study is largely because of the seasonality that occurs in the Pacific Northwest. So in the Pacific Northwest, we have uh, kind of cool winters and warm summers. We get most of our precipitation over here in the fall, uh, winter, and spring, and our summers are relatively dry. Since our, so our, since our winters are cool, we can store a lot of that precipitation in winter snowpacks in the mountains, and then when it melts in the spring, that runoff peak uh, dominates the annual hydrograph. With that, we can uh, come up with a few simple mechanistic models to get lower low stream flows. The first one is a shift in timing. So if you start your hydrograph recession earlier, Given the same amount of time, you can um, get a lower low flow. The mechanism for this is warming air temperature. So you have uh, warming air, it melts the snow earlier, the hydrograph recession starts earlier, and you decline to a lower stream flow. The other model is a decrease in starting magnitude. So uh, if you have a lower peak stream flow, um, given the same amount of time, you will get a lower low stream flow. And the mechanism for this is just less precipitation. So you get less precipitation, maybe less snowpack here. You start at a lower hydrograph place, and then um, you recess to a lower stream flow. So we're going to use annual stream flow amount as our proxy for precipitation amount. Uh, real quick, we're going to use um, center of timing of stream flow for a proxy for air temperature effects for our previous model. So uh, here's the list of our low flow metrics that we're going to do trends on, uh, along with the quantile that we're using. 7Q10 is a low flow metric used commonly by the Environmental Protection Agency for waste load allocation. It's the minimum stream flow that you would expect, the minimum weekly stream flow that you would expect every 10 years. We further constrained it to from June to November, so it's more indicative of stresses on ecosystems. By definition, that's the 10th percentile. We use the median value for August, uh, September, and summer flows, as well as center of timing. And for annual flow, we use the 25th percentile. And that's because uh, the trend that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest is lower stream flow in the driest of years. 
So here's what our uh, results show. Um, red is uh, higher decline or lower stream flow and blue would be higher low flows. Uh, the big circles mean that it was uh, significant at the alpha equals 0.1 level. Um, and here I'd just like to point out that the 7Q10 metric in the summertime is largely decreasing and uh, largely significant. So we account for serial and spatial correlations in this graph. So what we're looking at is percent of gauges on the y-axis and then the metric of interest on the x-axis. The green bars show the percent of gauges that showed negative trends, so the vast majority of them. Uh, the blue bars are significant trends at the point one level again. And accounting for autocorrelation, uh, that's the orange bars. Field significance is kind of a threshold, so these black bars are the amount of trends that you would expect to be negative just on random. Uh, a few things I'd like to show are I did some winter low flow metrics and uh, there's not very uh, many significant trends when you account for spatial and temporal co correlation. Also, uh, the mean summer one is a little bit lower, while mean September and mean August are significant. And that's largely because July flows are so variable. You can either be kind of on that hydrograph recession with a lot of flow, or you can already be into stable low flows. Here's just another way of looking at the data. Uh, so every white bar here is a data point. We have metrics on the y-axis and percent change on the um, x-axis. As you can see, most of the trends are over here in the declining zone um, in percent change. On the bottom is just a number of days uh, that the peak occurs earlier for center of timing. So largely earlier, that peak is happening earlier. So given this data, we want to kind of see what the sensitivities are to precipitation and temperature. And for that, we use a path analysis to kind of clarify the causality between those two. And what we're trying to do is remove the precipitation amount effect from the center of timing. So over here in the cartoon, we have precipitation amount, which uh, affects both stream discharge and center of timing. We have air temperature, which uh, mostly affects center of timing. Some of Walter's work has shown that um, the amount of precipitation that you receive as snowfall actually does affect the stream discharge, uh, but this is dominated by precipitation amount. And then uh, you do a path analysis to see kind of what affects that low flow metric the most. So here's the results from that. And what we're looking at on the right is the results from the path analysis, and this is just a simple correlation study. Uh, along the bottom is the correlation and net effect to annual flow, and on the y-axis is the correlation and net effect to center of timing. So this is just a one-to-one -one line. Anything plotting below that line is going to be uh, more uh, sensitive to annual flow than it is to <coughs> center of timing. So you can see that just by doing a simple correlation, uh, everything kind of plots below that line when you account for um, kind of the spurious effects of annual flow on center of timing, that really drops these things down. Um, the truth is probably somewhere between these two because of that confounding effect between percent precipitation as snow and uh, amount of stream flow. But once again, uh, it's a function of both temperature and precipitation amounts. So uh, in conclusions, uh, once again, our low flow metrics in the Pacific Northwest have declined historically, so in the past. Low flow metrics are sensitive to both precipitation and temperature, uh, and maybe more so precipitation. And um, in the future, the big question is, is um, will precipitation amounts, which are highly uncertain in the future, uh, kind of overshadow this continuing effect of warming trends. So we expect these warming trends to continue to make low flows lower, but um, with this uncertainty in precipitation, it's, it would be very easy for that precipitation amount to overshadow uh, the temperature effects. And thanks to John and Botsiglou for these um, conclusion slides here. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions.